Hey everyone, welcome to the series podcast. This is episode 123. I'm your host, Stelios, and the founder and director of Serres. And today's guest is William Crooks from Dennis Crooks, Fish Merchant of Whitby. The spring budget didn't extend the VAT reduction on hot food, and that must be a huge blow to many. But I don't think that there was much of a hint or acknowledgement from the government that it was ever on the table. Having thought about this over the last few years, I can see how VAT on hot food is a pain and massively unfair. And in my view, it does need to be challenged for a level playing field as consumers habits have completely changed over the years. In my mind, I think that hospitality and maybe tourism industry need to present a real solid case to reduce VAT and widen the collection pool. And then it could show government how that could be a bigger earner than it currently is. And also at the same time, not affect as many people. If you're on our mailing list, which you should be, you will know that we're in a process of just sorting out our new fulfillment centre. This will allow us to get orders out more efficiently. So my brain power has been pretty used up by racking, shelving, square footage, cubic heights. This is still ongoing. It's not going to be a quick thing. We should be getting the keys by the end of next week, all being well. We can then get the building professionally cleaned, get the floors sealed, and then we can start looking forward to forklifts and racking. So... There have been lots of updates to our online store. You will find a host of new labelling solutions. We have seen how our customers, i.e. you, have been using our I Love Fish and Chip labels to seal the bags and to stick customer receipts on the bags. The fried to perfection labels are being used either individually to you know, seal packaging or also to use, use it on the side of the bags where the paper is folded over. And this is somewhat similar to how McDonald's do theirs too. New to the lineup is our advanced food rotation labels, a little bit of a mouthful there. They are made completely of paper, no plastic involved at all, and have a different adhesive on the back. So they're a little lighter and shouldn't leave goo all over your surfaces. These are the most sort of, you know, logical things you can use really. You can just put your name, the date of when something was made, what it is, who made it, and when it's got to go in the bin if it hasn't been used or sold. So completely have a great use. Everyone should be using them. Make the EOTRO happy and make your job easier. Now, with so many of you serving up different species of fish at the moment, we have cre created some nice little labels that are really nifty and really cheap. They just have the name of the species. You just pop it on the order and Bob's your uncle. Simple, cheap, effective. Banish them pains that are next to the till that always never work. You're running around, you know, scribble on huss and you poke through the, the packaging. Don't bother. It's too much effort. This is just a nice little label. You know, they're, they're dead cheap, dead easy. All our label solutions are plastic free. They're in stock and usually with you next day. Today's podcast guest is Will Crook of Dennis Crook's Fish Merchants in Whitby. Dennis, Will's father, started the business in 1977 and is still involved in every aspect of the business. William and Holly, brother and sister, are now involved in the business, which makes it a proper family business. Their efforts have been recognised over the years and in 2015, they won the MSC Special Achievement Award, as well as the Su Seafood Supplier of the Year Award at Food Awards England. Orders placed in the morning, generally, are packed, iced, before having moved into a holding chiller and dispatched, in most cases, in one of their own vehicles on the same day. In the early days, almost 100% of their fish came from Whitby's fish market. Today, they source fish from many ports around the, the country, responding to ever restrictive rules and regulation placed on UK fishermen. But rest assured, their fish buyers hand select all of the best catch. If you want to find out more, we will put the website to Dennis Crook's Fish Merchants in the show notes. Anyway, on to the podcast with Will. Will, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are these things? Yeah, I mean, it's crackers for everyone at the time, at the yep. minute. In, uh, in anything to do with fish and chips is uh, it's crazy times. So uh, it's difficult. It's one word I'd use. Is it primarily fish and chip shops you supply, or do you do like restaurants and stuff as well? So we do restaurants, fine dining, um, hotels, care homes, 
pubs, fish and chip shops. If you need fish, so we will supply it sort of thing. Is it mostly like cod and haddock or is it again, like whatever species just you can get your hands on? Yeah, exactly. So if it comes out the sea, we will supply it. Um, also stuff like um, samphire and all your marsh grown products, we sell those too. Tell us a little bit about how Dennis, your father, started Dennis Crooks. Being from a deprived family, he grew up with five sisters in a two bedroom council house. So he's 15 and he thought, you know, Christ, I want to get out of here. So he got bus to Whitby. He lived in Hinderwell, which was um, 10 minutes away, and um, borrowed 500 quid from the bank and started buying fish on the market in Whitby and selling it. Was he involved in the fish game before? He did, yeah. So yeah, he, okay. I did. I did kind of give you the short version there but he did he did <laughs> he did work for uh, another company um, where he was manager and um, thought well I'm doing all the work here I might as well do it myself that's exactly what he did he went to Midland Bank got his 500 pounds bought a fish filleting bench uh, chained it literally to a post on the fish market and started cutting fish up and selling it from there a typical sort of I don't know it seems typical of that era, era anyway a lot of people did sort of you know that sort of thing Council tried to kick him off because it was council-owned property. Luckily, a good friend of ours now, their grandfather, actually said let him stay because he was town mayor, um, which was you know, really nice. Obviously, so he was quite entrepreneurial. He wanted to do it himself. Would you say it was like an instant success or did it just take time, just keep plugging away at it? it well, yeah, well, I don't think it was instant. Like anything, it always takes time. But it, it quickly became apparent that demand was outstripping what he was able to do. So he found a property which he bought um, employed people then and started sort of buying a few vehicles and selling fish, delivering it. I read on your website that the first location was on Silver Street. That's and correct. I've been down yeah. that road and it feels narrow yeah. walking down without a car. Like it, so <laughs> yeah. it just, it's a very <laughs> compact road, isn't it? So it's, it's like. Yeah, I can never imagine. I don't know how he did it from there, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it now and I think. Christ, we need a bit of bigger building now. You know, yeah. how did he ever do what he used to do over there? I don't know. But there is something about that, just just get on with it. Like, whereas our generation maybe looks at things and be like, no, I want a bigger unit. I want the nice this, the nice that, the better yeah. forklift and so on. And they're just like, no, just get on with it. Like, Yeah, he was in there in his, in his jeans and wellies. And <laughs> not a lot of people know, but the, you know, people sort of think, oh, Whitby Cod, you know, have it on the menu in random pub in london whitby cod fresh whitby cod but why like why is it so held in this high regard and it was just because my old man used to send all this whitby cod all over the country i mean he's not the only one to sort of take all the credit for doing it but he was a big sort of drive in whitby cod brand how far out would the boats be going from whitby to get the cod historically the they always used to stay really close in okay um, you know they'd only maybe go about 15 miles at the most that's quite close isn't it and they, yeah. they would only stay out for a couple of days they just used to that much fish i remember being a kid walking on the fish market tallying the fish as my dad was buying it and we literally had to climb over the fish you couldn't stand on the floor i remember me and paul from magpie cafe we went to the market just to have a look around yeah. and i was gobsmacked i couldn't believe like there wasn't a lot there to be honest it's just logistics it could still be full but where the fishing grounds are now prolific is nowhere near would be so it just makes more sense for the boats to land into peterhead especially with fuel costs as well and then how does it get to you guys from then so it gets trucked down and um, so there is companies who purely set out to just transport fish. For example, like Keyside. Exactly, yeah. So we've had Keyside here today. Um, they come here every day, Keyside Transport. It's now part of DFDS. So one thing that possibly might stress you out a little bit is the fact that there is so much abundant seafood in the UK yeah. and probably only a tiny amount of it is consumed by people in the UK. Would I be on the money there? You are, yeah. <laughs> and for whatever reason, everyone in the UK loves all of the tiger prawns and king prawns which mm -hmm. Im imports you know from way beyond um Vietnam. No one, yeah. exactly yeah why do people love prawns so much for for i say it's one of the big five in the uk so i think the big five is cod haddock salmon prawns tuna tuna uh, it must be because it's convenient it's got to be it's in a tin cod and haddock it's because it's premium white fish prawns yeah. though like how did that make I don't, you know i actually don't know it's one of those things I've never sat down at home and thought, I wonder why prawns are so popular. The best prawns are our native prawns, mm. you know, the langoustines, yeah. Dublin Bay prawns. But yeah, most of those get shipped out, you know, to Europe. It's just bonkers. So we ship all the good prawns out and import all the uh, <laughs> the farm prawns. <laughs> Yeah, it's bonkers. It is weird. Like, and, and also, they don't actually, those prawns, they're, they're, they're a big profit maker for a lot of restaurants because they don't actually have a lot of value. 
Mm -hmm. as a you know they've shipped over they probably the shipping probably costs more than the actual prawn absolutely yeah i was talking to someone the other day about um like the price of a container now on a ship it's just i think they told me it was something like thirty thousand us dollars for a container now which is unbelievable how do you justify that to anybody you can't well you know it has to be factored in somewhere and as a supplier like yourself it's you almost feel guilty for having to put your prices up and it puts you in a real position. Yeah, but ultimately we all have to run a business as do our customers. It's hard. I feel for everybody. I feel for the people above the chain, above me, and I feel for people below the chain. But it is what yeah. it is. It's going to be tight for everybody. And I think we've all just got to keep plugging away, haven't we? I mean, we have. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's it's food and there's people always going to want food. So I suppose we are quite lucky in that respect. And fish and chips has always been undervalued, I always think. You know, for the actual weight of food you get on a plate or in a takeaway, it's just, I don't think there's anything else can compete with value-wise for fish and chips. There's a few different arguments going on, and I sort of see all of them. So I think one with fish and chips is that it's great value, which is great. There's some people that sell it too cheap. There's others that, that rarely sell it too expensive. Um, but there's also others that do very big portions. Um, and there's others that just do normal portions. And I think it is a big mix. Uh, Andrew Crook said it right. He says, if fish and chips was invented 30 years ago, it would be almost perfect. But it, uh, you know, <laughs> but it isn't. It's invented 160 years ago. And with yeah. that, you do drag a lot of baggage. So it's interesting. And I think for years, I think maybe commodities were very sort of, let's say, very well priced. And people mm -hmm. have been very generous giving it to their customers yeah. at cheaper prices or bigger portions. But I do think that I would probably go one step further and say people need to be careful not to overprice fish and chips because it is also a volume business. And I think, you know, we're not Michelin star. You're not going to sell 100 portions at £25 a pot. You want to be selling thousands of portions, at, you know, eight nine ten quid whatever it is nowadays you know yeah and i know how distressing it is for people that have to do the costings at the minute i do think that volume is always going to be the winner yeah absolutely. it's just like ours so we have to do volume so margins are tiny so if we're cutting bigger fish we can afford to actually squeeze the margins a bit less because to cut bigger fish takes less time. You know, if you've got a box full of tiny fish, it can take you hours. A box full of big fish it can take you minutes. Let's go back to what's going on at the moment. Do you feel like you've got more demand at the moment? Oh, absolutely. It's um, fresh haddocks always been in high demand, but we have seen the demand increase again, probably from the shops which have always used frozen at sea, maybe a little bit frightened of moving over to fresh. Mm -hmm. But now there's that there actually comes a point where they've they have got options, but one of the standout options is for fresh. So we've probably had in the last two weeks in excess of 200 inquiries just from new shops. And the sad, you know, the sad thing is we have to turn most of them away because um, we just can't actually facilitate them. So it's uh, you know, it puts us in a bit of a, a nasty position, if you like, because you want to try and help people, but you also don't want to uh, let other customers down that have been with you for years. I guess your priority is them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we need to look after the people we've already got. You know, that have, that have supported us for years. In your mind, in your experience, talking to people that you know, frozen at sea haddocks, if we look at haddocks particularly, for the last year or so, they've been very tight to get hold of. I can't remember most of it. I've had people on the podcast who have discussed it to end's length, but I can't remember it all right now. But there's a multitude of issues. How comes, in your mind, has fresh haddock, locally caught let's say how comes that's remained abundant and you know i've seen you in the groups on the fish and chip groups a few times say no nope, there's no issue with fresh haddock what do you think that's the reason behind that i think a lot of it stems from obviously the people supplying the frozen at sea stuff they have to try and give their customer a reasonable explanation as to why the fish isn't there you know and i don't want to get too much into politics of the the fish world the top and bottom of it is really is the buyers so the, the big buyers is in country wise who's who's buying it for the least amount to work so you know if a boat can produce let's say to keep the figures you know small a ton of haddock without having to process it just just cut the head out and take the goods out it's far easier than it is to actually put it through a filleting line and you know if you've got a country that's willing to buy x amount at far better prices then they're going to send it there a lot of people have said for a long time that 
the Americans, Boston in particular, want mm-hmm. the haddocks that we've got, or at least that we were going to buy from, let's say, Norway, Iceland, and so on. Um, I say we, I mean as a country, because I'm not buying fish. But the flip side to that is, yesterday I was chatting to a customer in America, and she says, uh, oh, like, can you point me to the right direction? Because I'm going to need to buy some more fish, and I've been closed for a few months, and I'm going to relook at it. And I said, so, well, considering the Americans are buying all our haddock, I said, why don't you just get it from over there? She's like, well, they've told me the British have bought it all. And I'm like... Uh, like you know, <laughs> you know so no, it's the Chinese, <laughs> Chinese buy it all. Well, yeah, the Chinese do <laughs> generally buy it all, but but um, so yeah, it is it is one of those. But again, that doesn't really answer in in my mind why the fresh hasn't been affected at all. What's your what's your reasoning there? Do you think? I think you can't you can't ever compare the two. I think the two markets they don't really stay on the same path together. You know, there's no correlation between them. Because if, you, if you're if you set up to sell frozen at sea haddock, you, you can't take fresh haddock. You just haven't got the facilities to be able to process it, you know, or store it. It's it's a real tricky one to try and explain. Fresh fish, usually, when I say it's more volatile, it just it moves up and down a bit more all the time, doesn't it? In terms of price, let's just pick a figure out there. Let's say it's £50. Yesterday, it might be 48 Tomorrow, it'll be 52 The next day, it'll be 50 And it's always around there a little bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I'm just giving an example, you know? But at the moment, it just seems that it's quite steady. And everyone seems to be panicking and coming off frozen at sea. And it still stayed steady. And one of the things that a lot of people have said to me in the past is, especially if they're, let's say, proponents of frozen at sea, they'll say, look, fresh is great, but it's volatile and it can't cope with extra demand. Whereas you all must be seeing extra demand and it also mm. seems to be coping. It does, yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting way of looking at it, but I don't think about it too much. I just I deal with it every day. And I know as well as anybody else that buys fresh stuff that it, it fluctuates, well, maybe weekly. But actually, over the course of the year, it's pretty steady. You know, if you took a mean line through the price of it, actually, it's really stable. And, um, you know, it takes a bit of getting used to it because one week you might be paying, say, £50. The next week you could pay 55 but then the week after you might pay 45 which is the way it is whereas if you're buying say a frozen box of haddock a 40 pound box and you pay 200 pounds a box and someone says see the week after it's going to go to 220 pounds a box you don't really think about it probably it's 20 quid but actually when you boil it down to the per kilo price the fluctuations are bigger it's tricky time and at the moment a lot of people don't probably know who to believe or what to believe because there's so much noise coming from everywhere. That's where the opportunity strikes. It's when, you know, and I'm not saying I don't want to be the person to say it. I'm just going to say that opportunity is everywhere and people will strike where there is a gap in the market. You know, but I've been chatting to people today and they're saying, oh, you know, my fishman said next week it's going to be up 35%. And he's like, based on what? Mm. You know, just based on whatever. And he's like, you know, and he said, well, if you don't buy it today at this price, then, you know, we might not have it next week. It's going to be 35% more. And I think, I don't know, is there a bit of, do you think there is a bit of uh, is it, no, scalping is probably not the right word, but a bit of, yeah, profiteering yeah. maybe. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't like to say because it's that not means, something yes. we. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean you something... do it, but it means no, you, yeah, you agree with the yeah, you agree with the argument. Yeah, though, so. I'm sure there'll be some some people out there taking a you know a liberties, so to yeah. speak. But I guess I guess that exists in any industry, doesn't it? I guess it does. Yeah, I mean, the way we've always done it is just whatever we pay for it whatever it costs us to produce, we always just put a fair mm. margin onto it and that's it. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, if it's, if it's cheap one week, we pass the savings on. We never th- we never think, oh, we'll cash it in this week. You know, it's just, we like to try and just be fair and transparent with the customers. But I guess ultimately you are a business and you have costs and you have employees. You know, you've got to pay them and you want to pay them well. There's all of these challenges and I guess everyone needs to treat their business the same way. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we uh, I own mean, family business. My sister works here as well. We, we, we do treat it like as though it's um, it's like it is part of our family. So it's like it's all like our baby. You only get out of it what you put in. So you know we live and breathe it every day. Everyone talks about different species. You know everyone should try different species, not just rely on let's say cod and haddock, especially if you're fish and chip shop. How available are the other species? How, you know, really, if we look at pollock or coley, or should people be trying them more? Uh, I mean, it's it's a tough one. Because, I mean, like, there, there is a lot of Alaskan pollock, but it, if it had to be used in the, the quantities of cod and haddock, 
I just don't think it's there. I think you'd find a supply issue if everyone decided to switch to... Well, luckily, hopefully, nobody would have to switch over to it completely. But I think if someone did maybe, I don't know, try it as some one of these different species as special and hopefully build up a little bit of a following, could that maybe take some of the pressure off the other species that are at the top of the tree? Or does it not work like that? It could do. In theory, it works, I think. But in pra- yeah, in theory, in practice, it's always different. Well, I guess it is because it's assuming that it is good stuff in the first place. A lot of people are trying the frozen at or whatever frozen of some sort pollock and i'm not a fan of it i'm not i've had it before it's dry it's thin it's just not a nice product is the fresh any better it's a hard one because the, the fresh pollock can actually be more expensive I've, I've seen that so it, it's it's a difficult one the only the only one that is cheaper is coley but i'm yet to find a person that likes coley i actually like coley <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do, yeah. i've always found it just cooks like gray and i, I always know. thought it cooked out the grayness as a raw fish it has this blue gray tinge to it and when you cook it i find that there's probably a teeny bit of gray left yeah but i'm always led on flavor so i don't really go down like color yeah. but yeah i get what you mean i can understand why people don't like it as much and i think it i mean it's always it's one of those cod you're never ever going to get cod and from being the main fish and chip sort of products you just not i think if you put coley and chips on and even put it at maybe half the price you'll still probably get nowhere near you just won't i don't think that's that's just my opinion but i don't think you will you could be right but it's also worth people trying at least in a fish and chip setting i think you're probably right it's always going to be caught and had it but restaurants can probably be a bit more adventurous do it with something else you know people go to a restaurant to be delighted somewhat whereas i don't think people go to a fish and chip shop to be delighted do i don't know i do (laughs) 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 yeah i get you know i get that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you've got plenty you, you know you, you could trip over one every two steps in water. Um, i always feel like every other fish species just seems to be second fiddle and is that because they're crap or is it in our brain or is it a combination of both there must be a reason why cod and haddock became so popular and that's because they're bloody good i don't know what the answer is i guess it's always about availability isn't it cod and haddock for the most part it's always available yeah it might be a bit more expensive at times of the year it's generally always available i think in terms of yeah the cotton addict against other species you're never ever going to replace them or even come close to competing with them, I don't think. Uh, would you say that the yields of cod or haddock are better than other species of fish? Because, for example, like ling has a bone that goes all the way up the top. Would you say it that, does. although it's popular from the customer side, it must be quite popular from your side too, from a filleter side, because it's easier to work with than... Um, I mean, yeah, you can cook cod and haddock quicker than you can cut a ling. But, I mean, the, in terms of actual usable meat, they're all quite similar. You all get around 50%, you know, usable meat. Yeah, I don't think it's anything to do with the yield of it, to be honest. I just wondered if it was the perfect all-rounder for the filleters and the shops, if you get what I mean. I think it's like trying to say, you know, what else would you have with the fish and chips? It's salt and pepper, isn't it? It's- mm. Salt and pepper, salt and vinegar. vinegar, sorry. Yeah. Salt and yeah. pepper. There's some wood, just, some wood. It's just me, it's just me that has pepper yeah. on my chips. <laughs> oh my God. What are you going to tell me? You put gravy on your fish and chips next. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not a gravy. Uh, I'm not a fan of gravy on the chips. <laughs> for me, it's just, I always like to sort of, you know, when I've done podcasts with like MSC or anyone from like, you know, in Triple F or whatever, just talk about fish. There's just this huge reliance in the UK, not just fish and chip shops, on five species. And it's those big five. It just feels like what's going to break that, you know, what is going to break that reliance on those five species? Because again, tuna comes in a tin that's coming from the other side of the world cod and haddock which comes from sort of scandinavian countries iceland and all that lot and obviously the uk but then you've got salmon which is what scottish and then farm god knows where yeah Faroe islands yeah norway yeah talking about farmed fish do you see much scope for like farmed haddock and cod because i know they played with it a little bit but is it some yeah it's it's funny you mentioned that actually because we did have um, a guy contact us that's farming cod in norway yeah and we can try some, and it was good. But it, for whatever reason, farm cod, it always ends up looking like a carp. It ends up being really short and really, like, fat and deep. So it's not, it's not like the elongated cod you'd ever imagine as a wild cod. It, it's strange. And the skin's really thick. What do they put that down to when you've asked them? I don't, they don't know. They don't really say much. It, it, what it'll be, I know what it'll be, is because of the, the lack of exercise. I they think. can't swim very far. It's one they've, um, you know, they've perfected salmon, they've perfected sea bass, um, even turtles but they've perfected really 
apart from the colouring. Yeah. Because sometimes you get turbid, you get on a farm turbid, you end up with uh, two dark sides sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> which is quite interesting. <laughs> One of the arguments before about, I think it was uh, farm cod, is that there just wasn't the appetite for it because the pricing. But now the pricing has all sort of shifted upwards a little bit. Maybe that makes it worthwhile for someone. I mean, they're really, they, go, they were going down the company we sort of got contacted by was they were trying to go more down the premium line. Yep. So in the terms of sending it into the fine dining. So like a, well. a scree type cod. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. You know, trying to have the same sort of stigma as the scree, I suppose, which is it's just coming to an end, the scree season. And that wasn't really expensive this year either. Like, it was weird. That was very, yeah, like my, my mate <laughs> got a call from his fish supplier. I can't remember who it was. And they said, oh, scree. And he was like, he was just shocked at the price. He was just like, mm. wow. Like, couldn't believe yeah, it. We, you buy that in like headless, basically headless yeah. and gutted stuff. And the price was even less money than you'd be buying normal cod yeah. for, which was um, unbelievable. If it was, let's say, high end, would that be good? Would that take the pressure off the supply or does it all end it up? Wouldn't. No. It just wouldn't, though, because no. the, you know, the high end restaurants, they're not using the volumes that the fish and chip shops are. No. Yeah. To be honest, I don't think it'd make any difference. But I guess it's just, it's just my humble opinion, but. Yeah, I can't. It wouldn't make any difference at all. You know, everyone wants to sort of see things loosen up a little bit, and maybe it's still a bit short term, you know, but it'd be interesting to see what happens. In your mind, you probably didn't see the growth, but you see it now. You see a lot of people, well, the majority of fish and chip shops, let's say, using a frozen at sea product, which is nearly all of it from outside British waters. In your mind, what would you like to see? Would you like to see? everyone sort of going back to a British product. I mean, that's the ideal, isn't it? But it, it's, I don't think it's ever going to happen. What's stopping that, do you think? I think there's just, there's not the investment there in terms of boats, actually processing factories. And you've got to think that over the years, there's that many people have just disappeared or the boats have been decommissioned and they've never been replaced. You know, so if you think, if there was 100 boats 30 years ago, none of them would be replaced after every every time someone decided, well, I'll, I'll just sell up now. There was never a replacement. So that would take a lot of forward investment, wouldn't it? You know, like, so even if, I don't know, for example, you wanted to sort of grow that, let's say double the figure of, let's say, fish and chip shops that use fresh, you'd almost have to say we'd need double the processors, double the boat. The ones that are currently around need investment, so we need to make those boats better. I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny one because it's a, the actual fishing trade. It's not very appealing. I guess it's not. People. No, I guess it's not. You know, if, you, if you're in school, it's not. there's not that many people want to go and either work on a fishing boat or want to come cut fish up, which is a bit of a problem we've got at the minute. But it's a well-paid so, trade though, isn't it? Like, I think fishermen do well, don't they? It's not like, you know, it's not like it would have been like in the 1900s. Um, I mean, I don't know. It's I suppose it's relative, isn't it? It's risk for reward. It's one of the most dangerous, probably challenging jobs you could do yeah. going out fishing. So they deserve to be rewarded. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I weren't knocking uh, that by the way. I'm just saying, like, no, I'm just trying to say that yeah. like, as a way of appealing to younger people to get into the job. If you get what I mean. Yeah, I don't think it's the pay as such. I just don't think it's it's the lifestyle with it as well. Yeah, I mean, you, there's a massive sacrifice that comes with it. I just don't think a lot of people are prepared to do it now. You know, they look on their phones on Instagram and they don't want to sit on a fishing boat and have four hours working and then a few hours sleep and then four hours working and then a few hours sleep. Yeah. You know, do that for five days solid. It's not everyone's... um, No idea of heaven everyone wants to be an instagram influencer now anyway so i think i might be now (laughs) but he's he's a weird one isn't it i've met a few of these fishermen and they're nice guys and they work really hard and again they're well rewarded they're good business people just like farmers that i meet and i think our industry maybe looks at that and thinks oh it's all right for the farmer it's all right for the fisherman they do all right but again fishing is a dangerous occupation maybe a farming potatoes isn't a dangerous occupation but it's a it's an investment that people are you know, with time and money and so on. So, and they're dealing with big numbers too. Yeah, it can get fr- it can get frightening, and it's the cost of fuel at the minute has had a massive impact on them. The thing is, a lot of the, it only gets documented. All the rosy stuff gets documented, but a lot of people don't see the bad times. You know, like people have just seen um, all the documentaries on fishing and not seen the bad bits. Well, again, it's like everything in it. Everyone looks at the good things and oh, that's great. Oh, I'd love that. But there's so much to be said about you know how hard the industry is one of the biggest things that we see is that a lot of the fresh fish or the good stuff whether it's shellfish or you know is being sent to like france they love our fish and yet the british people don't really want it because all they want is cod and haddock and maybe a bit of salmon you know if, if you were prime minister for a day what would you do that could possibly get people eating more british seafood that's a tough one i think the issue is 
it's it's all price based. Yeah, really, because historically fish has always been pretty cheap, and it's not anymore. And people in in particularly in this country have always had this um, sort of mentality that fish is just a cheap meal, but it's it's not. And actually, there's no other industry in the world that takes as much effort to go and get the product. And it's probably well, it is the last hunter gatherer industry in the world isn't it right correct me if i'm wrong but i think i guess in volume it's the last food that's being fished and caught whereas if you're going out hunting some grouse then that's probably the odd one isn't it fish is yeah. the biggest wild caught product isn't it definitely yeah because yeah. i mean you, you, you start off in your boat yeah you've got a good idea of where maybe fish are going to be but there's still no guarantees but all this fancy equipment now don't you well they do <laughs> <laughs> You must talk to quite a few fishermen. Over the next few years, what are they saying is going to be the hardest challenges for them, do you think? The, the hardest challenges they face are probably going to be exports, to be honest, because, I mean, it directly impacts them. It might not uh, impact them in a way where they have to deal with it, but it impacts the merchants who have to deal with it. And it's becoming less and less attractive to export stuff. One of the things with this Russia war, sorry to interject there, is that Everyone's mm-hmm. talking about haddock and cod coming from Russian seas. But actually, the biggest buyer of British pelagics is Russia. I didn't realise that. I had no idea about that either. I mean, there's there's a cold store in, uh, in Scotland. It's just full of that, that they can't sell to Russia. Well, they won't be happy. That's quite a tight-knit group of fishermen, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, because they go and catch them in... They go and, like, chase the shells and catch them in massive numbers and big boats. I mean, it's... I think they're going off topic a little bit, but they, the whole situation in the world at the minute with Ukraine... And what the government have done is that they've actually damaged this country more, in my opinion, than they have Russia. <laughs> There's a friend of mine who said, you might have seen him on the groups, his name's Mark Drummond, and he yeah. said, anything that is done to affect Russia will no doubt affect the UK because that is how sanctions work. Everyone thinks, oh yeah, let's stick on one. But actually, it affects us too. In my eyes, actually, on the fishing side, government have put um, a 30% import duty on Russian caught fish, but actually that doesn't affect Russia because, yeah, fair enough, people aren't going to buy the Russian stuff anymore. That, well, the Russians won't mind. All they'll do is they'll say to the boats, sell it to China. Yeah, we'll just switch the boats to uh, doing H&G. They're not going to lose out. Yeah, it's just it's slightly annoying because it's, it's, the, it's the fish and chip shops and the, the general public that are paying for it, and it's not fair. In the government's eyes, the whole thing isn't fair. They didn't ask for it, and guess what else can you do? We all have opinions, I guess, but none of us have the right answers do we if more people go on to fresh haddock and cod will it start creeping up especially with not being able to catch more or can boats just keep going out keep going out and getting more it's a tough one um because we don't just rely on the uk vessels we wouldn't have a business if we did being based where we are it's quite difficult without direct access to the market so there is a lot of fish comes into the country fresh but like you say, if everyone had to switch to fresh all of a sudden, we would no one would go. Let, right, let's go in for percentages. What would happen if it was 10%? It would be no problem. That wouldn't be a problem. Another, tw- uh, let's say 20%. Would things start to get a bit... I think things start, might, you know, you might, might see a bit of creaking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've seen just, I mean, cod, for instance, cause cod's the big one at the minute. Yeah. We've seen fresh cod sales go up massively. I mean, what do you do? You've got to, you've got to do what you, you do to make a living, don't you? Yeah. So we, we've probably gone from selling, say, a ratio of 70% addict to 30% cod mm-hmm. to now 50-50, which is massive for us. To my view, I want to try and help people that are really struggling because there's a lot of shops out there that haven't had the, so the capital to maybe put fish aside, mm-hmm. like a lot of them have. You know, people just buy it weekly. And if the people that buy it weekly, they're, they're going to really struggle because yeah. it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And I don't think people have been told about it. And if it gets worse, I guess that we're going to see some sort of catastrophes along the way, aren't we? Yeah, it's going to be sad times because there's going to be people dropped by the wayside. It's usually the ones that feel like they can't put the prices up. To me, you've got two options. You, you, you put your price up or you, you're going to have to shut the door. Mm. So it's not a hard choice for me. You just, you just have to put your price up. If we made it as simple as that, if you had to like put your price up to stay in business, well, yeah, I'd just guess I'd rather be open <laughs> yeah. and have less customers if that was the case. Yeah, I see. You're gonna you're gonna get some, you know, lose customers and maybe go somewhere else. But actually, the the place they go are gonna put the prices up too because they're gonna have to. Well, exactly. And I think that is one of the things. Everything's going up anyway. I just think put your prices up, hide behind that. You only have to go past the petrol station to see that everything's gone up. Yeah, everyone feels like sort of duty in 
to explain to the customers why they put the price up as well. It must be the only industry that does that. I, I, you're not going to the supermarket and they have signs everywhere and say, oh, sorry, we've had to put the prices up on this, this, this. You know, it's just, it's, I find it a bit strange. No, I agree. You don't, you don't go to the supermarket and have a note next to the beans that says, oh, they've gone up now because of this. And you just don't, mm. you just accept that things go up. I'm not a big fan of shouting we're the most expensivest meal on the market. <laughs> I just don't think it's great. No. I truly believe that it is the most best value for money product on the market. I think it's probably one of the best takeaways on the market. And it is a great British classic whilst we're there. But shouting out in the media, hey, we're more expensive than everything else that's just gone up too. I think mm-hmm. consumers are just going to think, well, I've got bills to pay. I, you know, I ain't going to go yeah. there. Well, I, I thought exactly the same thing as you. But I mean, it's I know Andrew Crooks had a always had a real good go at trying to explain to people about it. I felt a little bit sorry for him, to be honest. Um, cause he's had a lot to deal with. <laughs> um, but it's you don't know what to do for the best at the minute, I suppose. You know, because there's people that want to try and explain to people, I suppose, why they're having to whack the prices up. But actually, is it doing more harm than good? I don't know. Well, I think the answer is: Do you see McDonald's saying that they've put their prices up? You don't. No. I always say, if in doubt, just look at what McDonald's do. They're always a market leader. They've always, they always have been. I give Andrew credit for everything he's done. I don't agree with everything. He knows that. We text each other all the time. He will he will know that I don't agree with everything because we're human and we're not meant to. But I give him credit for everything that he's done. I think that he's really rallied behind the cause that he believes in. And that's okay. Exactly. Yeah. No, he's, he's, I think he's done, a, he's done a brilliant job, to be honest. I wouldn't like to be in this position. No, I wouldn't. And I think, you know, it is a thankless task. I know they always say that. Then they do work on behalf of the whole industry, although only, I don't know, five, six, seven percent pay for it. So whatever you say, that is hard. And, you know, and I see all the time people say, oh, the NFFF should do this. And nine times out of ten, those people aren't members. You can understand how that would be frustrating for them, too, because if everybody was a member, Imagine what they could do. But again, the one thing I disagree with, and it's easy for me to sit on this side of the microphone and say this, I just don't agree. Dis- I disagree, shall I say, with shouting out that we're the most expensive. I just don't get the logic. Yeah. I understand what he was trying to do, and but I just think that the story that he was trying to sell wasn't sexy to the media. And I think that's the hardest thing. Well, media being the media, they always take something and run with it, but they run with it in a, a way to make it appear more... Um... Not quite sure what I'm trying to say, but <laughs> trying to get you angry, I try to create a reaction almost. It's sort of like yeah. yeah, they take something and they always change it slightly. You know that this whole fish and chips is going to be ten pound. It probably is in most places. Nobody bloody cares and nobody realises. It should be that anyway. It should be it's still cheaper. That I think it should be whatever the market dictates. I'm a free market thinker. I truly believe that. The market dictates what your price of fish is. And then the person who buys that fish then dictates what he sells it for because he's done his sums. He's figured out that he wants to work at 40%, 50%, 60%, 80% if he wants. He figures out what he wants to do or she, because I'm being sexy. So if they all figure out their GP and then figure out, am I happy at that figure? You know, can I carry on working at that number? And if all those answers are yes or at least positive for the most part, then everything fits in nicely. I think telling everybody on a blanket scale, stick your prices up might harm others, but it may help others. So and again, that's why you've got to have a few different types of advice for different operators. Yeah. What if somebody is already at 65 percent GP and their net profit is great, too? And they're actually doing okay. I mean, I think a lot of it is people just need to believe in themselves and what they're doing. Whether it's right or wrong, I don't really pay much attention to what anyone else is doing in, in my sort of job anywhere else. I keep my eye on bits and bobs, but I don't really pay any attention to what people are doing. Mm. I just we do our own thing and believe in what we do and that's it. Yeah. I don't really pay attention to anybody else's pricing either. Well, again, because you've got to work with what you've got. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I did hear a funny little tidbit the other day about you. <laughs> Go on. <man. laughs> I heard that your pet hate is people ringing and asking what the price is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and, if I, and it's usually because I have that conversation about 400 times a day. <laughs> I remember once I, I did an exhibition a few years ago. I'd be at the stand and someone walks up to me. It was a fish and chip exhibition. They just walk up to me. They don't know me. We've only been in business like two years. So they're like, how much is it? And I look around and I'm like, how much is what? And they're like, well, what do you do? And I was like, well, you, yeah. what do we do? And they're like, I don't know. And I was like, yeah. how can you walk over to me 
in a crowded room and say, how much is it when you don't know what we do? And there's, there's so much to it. It's like when someone asks me, how much is cod? Well, it's like, well, what size do you want? <laughs> how do you want it prepping? Whereabouts is your shop? I guess that would be pretty annoying because it's a fresh customer. They've come out of the blue from nowhere. And it's literally yeah. how much is it? When you're just like, one minute, mate, we do a bit more than that. And it's like, are you going to pay me? <laughs> <laughs> well, people forget that this is the, this is here. I always say to people, oh, it's great getting a sale, but what's even better is getting the money in the bank. We say, we, we still, we always say we've not, we've not sold it until we've got the money. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true. Given, you've given it away. It's yeah. so true. So I'd much rather sell smaller amounts to get the money for it than large amounts. Yeah. Be having to pester someone for money. Because it's uh, that's another thing I hate doing. I hate having to pester people to pay. Well, you're wasting your time at that point, aren't you? You, you, yeah. you should be doing something else, which is you know. But it, people may feel guilty for doing it as well. And it's you know, I just I don't like it. I mean, yeah, touch wood, we're uh, we're pretty good. But, and again, the business is a transaction of two sides. If 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 one person isn't living up to that deal, then you don't want them as a customer, do you? Really? No, it's it's tough. It really is tough. Yeah. I know a lot of seafood and shellfish get sent over abroad, but does haddock and cod, British haddock and cod, get sent abroad as well? Is that a big thing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah of course so it is, yeah. if it didn't as much, would that be enough to supply more? Oh, well, it would be more fish and chip shops, but would you? Would it be a large amount? Would it be worthwhile? Um, it wouldn't be a massive no. amount. I don't think it would make much difference, no. to be honest. No, because, I mean, they, you'd literally have to draw upon all of the fresh supplies from Iceland, yeah. Faroe Islands, Norway. And you could probably only then would you be able to supply everyone. Yeah. But there's still, you still actually wouldn't be able to get it processing out to everyone here, I don't think. No. That's still, um, so the key issue is the processing side, would you say? Yeah. I mean, they could process it in other countries, but part and parcel of what we do is we get to hands on, old fashioned way of preparing it ourselves, processing it ourselves all by hand. I mean, the only thing we use machines for is skinning this fish. Okay. Everything else, everything else is done by hand, all wow. the old traditional ways. And um, you know, if you were getting it processed in Iceland, say, you've lost that small little bit of love mm. you've put into the fish. Yeah. You know, it's just a, it just becomes nondescript. You just passed it on. It is a real like labour of love. Yeah, I guess it is. But then you know, it makes you worry about what happens when you've had enough. When you've done too much and nobody else wants to step in and do it, then what? God, I know. I've just had a little girl as well. I don't think it's a girl's job. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. You know, I've I've seen women in business that put men to shame. To be honest, so you never know. <laughs> oh, my sister's got a little boy, so maybe. Yeah, there you go, then. <laughs> yeah. You know, but yeah, I think role reversal. My uh, my sister's uh, little lad can do something. Yeah. Do you know? Um, do you know a little bit about MSC? Yeah, so we're MSC certified. Okay. Yeah. So is all your fish that you touch essentially MSC certified then? It isn't, no. Yeah, so we have to have um, quite strict procedures in place for handling MSC stuff and non-MSC stuff, like different segregation areas and fridges. And obviously on the actual workbenches, only MSC stuff can be on that particular bench. And... Sounds like right faff. <laughs> well, I mean, we get we get MSC. Well, we did used to get MSC cod from the North Sea, but we don't anymore. But we still get MSC cod from like Norway. What do you think puts like except the, the British trawlers? What puts them off MSC? Do you think? Obviously, Iceland, Norway, they've all thrown themselves into it a bit. They have, yeah. I mean, it's there's a lot of obviously um, talk about MSC, whether it's a good thing or a mm-hmm. bad thing. But it's I, don't, I think it can only be positive. Yeah. To be honest, I don't think there's any negatives. What, one of my customers I was chatting to once said to me, "Look, I don't mind the MSE, got no issue with them, but I just think if it's so good what they're doing, why isn't it government mandated?" Yeah, I suppose, I suppose you're right. And I did think of that actually. Like, why, you know, if it is, I'm not knocking them. I actually like MSC. I like the people at MSC, but it does make sense. Like, if it is actually so good what they're doing, why doesn't government government just mandate it? And then everyone's done it. Just don't get the government involved in it because they want money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys at, at, um, at Crooks, you deliver all over the country or is it mostly your own vehicles locally and then you can cover areas with vehicles that you rent out, let's say? Or... Yeah, so we have our own vehicles do up, up as north as like Newcastle, as far across as like Harrogate, Skipton and as far down south as like Hull. Okay. Um, but then we do send, bizarrely, like you wouldn't imagine it, but we do send quite a lot of stuff on Korea, okay. on like parcel boats. Um and we also send fish on like specialist refrigerated transport, like 
Quayside, the mm. FDS. Um, so does, we do cover the whole country. Okay. And I guess yeah. if it's going to be like Parcel Force or FedEx, it's just the ice packs, I guess. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's just an insulated like container inside a, a cardboard box with gel ice packs, and then we vacuum pack the fish oh, wow. inside there. That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Uh, it really helps for the... You know, if you get like a, a country pub in the middle of nowhere that no one would deliver to because it's just not worthwhile. It really helps for them. Yeah. Well, I guess it does. And they don't have to take huge volumes, I guess. They can just take, you no. know. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I guess, and then you've got the other option. If someone is taking fish and chip style volumes, you know, 20, 30 yeah. stone a week for argument's sake, yeah. then they can go on the back of a van, can't they? They can, yeah. I mean, we, we literally loaded a parcel for us on them yesterday with about half a ton wow. of fish. <laughs> Which, um, that was all fish and chip shop stuff. Wow. Um, and it's, it's just another tool, if yeah. you like, in our box that we can use. Yeah. We can draw upon it when we need it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's mega time consuming, but. Yeah. Yeah, well. I, extra. Yeah. You probably wouldn't want all of your business like that, but you're happy to have that business too, so. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We try not to do too much of it like that, to be honest, because it's, yeah, it just takes up so much time packing it all up. Would it ever be a problem in the summer or is it all right because of those ice packs? Yeah. I mean, I've tested it myself. Yeah. And um, we do have really good gel ice packs and they, they do last. Okay. They, they stay frozen 24 wow, hours. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm quite lucky. All of our product is ambient. So when we send it, it just, it's fine. You don't have to yeah. think about it at all. Yeah. I mean, does the thing we're selling all the fresh produce, you do go home and, you have sleepless nights about it. <laughs> yeah, but you, did it get there? Did it not get there? Or yeah, uh, it's, yeah, and it it's just like you've got all this stuff in the fridge, and it's like I need to sell it all like tomorrow, and it's yeah, it's just it's tough. Yeah, it's a lot on your head all the time. I'm always a good like a big believer, and I'll always sort of know more than I say. Mm. You know, so I, there's some things which I've never ever sort of publicly said, yeah. just because they're our own little. Tricks, if you yeah, like. I guess. Yeah, well, everyone's got to have tricks up their sleeve, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. it's the sign of a good business. You can't, not everything can be open and transparent. I'm trying to think, the only thing we maybe haven't covered is over COVID. What happened over COVID? We work. Was it all right? Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, it was. I mean, we obviously all the restaurant trade stopped. Um, we still supplied takeaways, but we did actually completely stop for about a month just to sort of gauge what was happening. If you like, sit back and watch and see what other people were doing and we set up a home delivery, yep. sort of service, which was brilliant. But then, hey, okay, and the problem of when everything reopened, we didn't actually have time for it. So now we've got this problem of people still wanting their home deliveries. We, we can't really offer them. We, we are still doing a few, but not many. It's something you could carry on, but I guess you want to be dealing with the bulk side, I guess. That's that's bit better isn't it i think like every single business you need to concentrate on actually was close to home yeah so now obviously with everything costs going up we need to concentrate on what we've got nearby least transportation costs biggest quantities possible you know if you it's yeah it's a case of just sitting back and taking stock of what we've got i think and looking after what we've got Uh, you see some people in business and they have this ultra focus and then you see other people in business that spread out and do lots of different things. And I always think those that have an ultra focus, they know what they're doing. They know what they've got to do. You know, you've got to wake up tomorrow. You need X amount of cotton haddock or whatever it is that you need to sell that day. And you're just going to yeah. move that product. And there's others that are like, no, I'm going to do a bit of this. I'm going to do a bit of that. And I feel like you sp- things start to sprawl a little bit. You can only spread yourself so like thinly, can't you? Yeah. Before, you know, the bits of the business start creaking. I think we're at about max at the minute for- for staff and everything. I mean, everyone's got staffing problems. Uh, we, you know, we've just got constant adverts out for staff at the minute. We just took the decision to give everyone like a, a big pay rise come April. Everyone's on well above minimum wage anyway. And it was just our sort of way of saying thank you, you know, to the staff that are here and thanks for staying with us. And, you know, we don't want you to sort of like look elsewhere for a job because you, you, all your household bills have shot up. And it's something that I actually I quite enjoy doing, paying the staff more money. Yeah. As, as, as daft as it sounds. Well, I guess it's a nice thing. If you can make it work, it's a nice thing, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's nice to show your employees, your team, that you value them. If you can and it's not going to put the business at risk, then it's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, because yeah. you know, I guess yeah. you want people to come to work and be happy and they want to be there as opposed to 
I need to be there. I've got no choice. You know, they're two different yeah. things, aren't they? Exactly. You know, you know. If so you've got a happy workforce, they're gonna they're gonna be more productive. Yeah, yeah. You'd hope. I mean, it's, if it's a case of they get a few extra stone of fish a, a cut a day each, it's it's worth it. Well, and also if the fish that your customers are receiving is perfect and no bone in it and perfectly sliced and just that care and attention been taken over it, it actually is a good way to build customers too. So, yeah, of course it is. I mean, we're we're only human, so we do make mistakes. Yeah, um, but we try and make everything perfect for everyone. Yeah, you know and, and I'd like to say 99% of the time it is, but there's, you know, there's always the old time where it isn't and it's annoying, but we, you know, we sort it out. That's all you can do. On that note, I will let you go. Thanks for your time today. Definitely interesting times ahead. Yeah, I think so too. All righty, mate. All right, it's done. Have a good Thanks one. Thanks a lot. Take care, mate. Massive thank you to Will for coming on the Sarah's podcast. To find out more about Dennis Crooks Fish Merchants, you will see the links in our show notes or visit denniscrooks.co.uk. Be sure to share the Sarah's podcast with your friends and on social media. If you like this episode, then chances are others will like it too.